special force and recover a UAV. Our task was to design and uh, and res uh, to design a uh, rescue UAV to retrieve wounded special forces soldiers behind enemy lines. Um, the current situation is that if a special forces soldier is wounded, um, the current um, requirement is for the team members to leave them behind, um, as the risk is too high as they will be compromised. Um, the problem with this is that if we were to send a rescue mission, it would put more human lives at risk. In the example of the battle of Takoga, uh, a team of special forces <coughs> were trapped behind enemy lines in Afghanistan, and the ensuing rescue operation led to seven casualties and the loss of two Chinook helicopters. As you can see here, the countries highlighted in blue are the countries that have uh, special forces that, and the green countries um, on top of that also have the special forces, but they also have the budget and the capability to be able to um, insert behind enemy lines. The red highlighted countries, they are the current plot zones for, uh, and predicted areas in which these special forces troops will be operating in. So we have framed our mission with the three R's, namely um, the reach phase, the retreat phase, and the return phase. Um, these will inform our specifications for our aircraft. As you can see, the operating radius of 100 miles was determined by one case, uh, a few case studies, the most extreme of which was the Bravo 20 case, where um, four, a group of eight SAS troops were inserted behind enemy lines in Iraq in the first Gulf War. They were inserted from Saudi Arabia into Iraq to uh, sabotage the main supply route. As you can see, they inserted a maximum of 100 miles, and this is our design operating radius. For the retrieval phase, the operating altitude we have determined to be from mean sea level to 10,000 feet. This is because, um, as in the case of the Battle of Tucker Jar, as I mentioned earlier, um, as you can see in the white part of the circle region, this area is very mountainous and it extends upward of 8,000 feet. This is therefore really important for us to be able to access these areas. As for the return, our payload uh, we determined to be 120 kilograms as that would be the weight of a, a fully laden Special Forces soldier. Um, the size constraints of the patient compartment within the aircraft um, would be uh, 2,110 millimeters in height and 600 millimeters in width in most cases. Uh, this is sufficient for the patient as well as the stretcher um, which we'll use to carry him and load him into the aircraft. <coughs> now I'll, I'll hand over to Michael who will discuss the configurations. Uh, thank you, Henry. Um, just to reiterate what Henry said, we, um, we have three phases to our mission. There's three hours reach, retreat, and return. And they also shape the configuration of our aircraft. Um, in order to be able to land anywhere, uh, in places that we don't know what the terrain is like, we need to have vertical takeoff because we're not necessarily going to be able to land on a runway. Um, in order to achieve vertical takeoff, we have three lifting services. We have two lifting fans in the wings and one lifting fan in the nose. Uh, the thrust to rate ratio of the lifting fans at, at about 10,000 feet is 1.22. And this extra 22% of thrust allows us to maneuver and, um, and resist gust loadings and stuff like that. In order to maintain pitch and yaw control, the nose fan uh, has veins on the underside of the duct. Uh, these veins can rotate left and right in order to maintain that yaw moment for that yaw stability, and also varying the thrust that um, the nose is being actuated by um, can be used for pitch control. Uh, for the reach part of the mission, we also need to be able to find um, the patient of the penalty. In order to be able to do this, we will be navigating via satellite navigation systems. And however, if we're outside the broadcast range or for some reason we have new satellite image, we need, um, we need backup systems. And these will include an inertial navigation system, which we 
based on dead reckoning, as well as a search and rescue uh, correction finder. This requires the special forces team to have a beacon on them. And in the unfortunate circumstances, they also do not have that. We will have to rely on uh, radar and camera. Radar will be also be able to help us train that and stuff like that. Uh, here's a basic simulation of how we would load the patient. Um, we opted for a nose configuration because we needed to be able to get the patient underneath the quarter quarter of the wing, and we also have the engine toward the tail uh, trailing into the wing. Uh, it requires a minimum of two people to lift up the patient. Uh, that would be from the tail, uh, the toes, and the head, and the third structure. And this is good because, of, as Henry said, there's a, a minimum of four units in the special forces team, so one person can remain on lookout. Uh, these rails will be extended in order to be able to. Uh, support the load of the passenger and also they'll slide in with, to the housing of the patient. In order to keep the patient safe, we also decided to uh, load him uh, feet first because we wanted to face away from the engine as far as possible. As you can see here, it's quite a confined space and uh, so we do need some oxygen supply uh, in order to also help the patient's safety. Uh, the final stage of the mission is the return phase. Um, we will be either returning to the same base that we left off at, or an intermediary transport solution might be needed if the patient's safety is compromised. This may require another medevac vehicle to be uh, intercept us somewhere along the way, and this can help the patient if they can to perform some basic first aid uh, on the way to the medical facility. And ideally, the whole mission will take two hours. On our platform to David, we'll discuss our structures. Uh, as you can see, our structure consists of two uh, various structures. So you have a semi-monocoque structure, as we know, is a very efficient way of carrying uh, structure loads uh, through the aircraft. Uh, however, there's a touch control for with cutouts. As we know with structural uh, semi-monocoque structures, uh, cutouts require reinforcement. You need to reinforce the areas where you're going to do cutouts. As a result, this is not possible with the nose. We have all we have been trained purely by usable area of which. Uh, uh, the vans uh, will be located in. As a result, a space plane was used to pull the front of this aircraft. However, the rest of the aircraft is used uses a semi monocoque structure uh, where you have a king frame and a queen frame where your two spars that generate your wing structure. And this is uh, loads through the wing are transferred into your fuselage through these frames. We also have a tertiary frame which allows a medium which the uh, space frame loads can be transferred into the fuselage, as well as providing that reinforcement, as I previously mentioned, with a much semi monocoque structure. Provide that uh, reinforcement. As we know from the next slide, there's a weird breakdown of the weight, structural weight of the aircraft. The weight of the aircraft is well over 30% 30 uh, 30 of the aircraft's weight. This is a result of the aircraft being applied to VTOL. VTOL puts a tremendous load on the aircraft, and the structure needs to be there to account for that. This, uh, if we go to the next slide, we have a more close up look on this nose structure. So you can see here, this is the nose structure consisting of a uh, lift fan and a nose prop motor. As we know, the nose prop motor will indeed, uh, induce torsional load onto the space frame. The lift fan, on the other hand, will be responsible for providing lift and pitch control um, being held in the aircraft. As a result, we'll create a bending moment. This whole structure can be idealized as a cantilever until you understand how all the loads are being transferred to the forward frame. And moving on to the next slide, we have uh, the wing support structure. So this is an important part of the aircraft. That's why we opted out to go with four points of contact. And it provides a point of extra redundancy, as this is a very crucial vital role of the aircraft. Um, as we've seen here, the four points are your front spar, rear spar, and your two adjacent ribs on either side of it. Uh, of the lifting van. This is then connected to the thrust bearing, which consists of a tapered roller section, which is very good for axial loads and radial loads, which the lift van will produce next and impart into the rest of the structure. I will now pass on to Rahul, who will talk about aerodynamics. Uh, CFD, uh, we all pretty much know that it's uh, used to model the real life situation. Oh, this was a big challenge for us, mainly due to the fact that it had a massive hole right in the middle of the wing. 
So as you can see from the figure, what actually happened was the flow was going through the hole and causing a lot of uh, flow char um, store characteristics and uh, store problems. So we have to validate this model somehow. So what I did was, uh, what we did was, sorry, uh, we modeled uh, the CFD of a uh, full three-dimensional wing and validated that against uh, published data and then uh, used this model to validate our results. Uh, but what we believe is the interaction between the whole, uh, between the flow and the rotor is going to be very different to what is depicted uh, in this simulation, mainly because the rotors are spinning all the time uh, during flight. So what we did, uh, like this model pretty much provides us with the lowest bound of the amount of lift that we're going to generate from uh, the wing. So uh, we kind of assumed that we would be generating about 15% of the lift uh, from the lifting fans during the entire flight system moving all the time. Um, another design consideration was the position of the intake. Um, now, why is that, that important? It's because it causes boundary ingestion. Now, just giving you a quick recap of what boundary ingestion is, is the air goes through the intake at very slow velocities and it causes the uh, tip of the compressor blades of the engine to stall. Now, that's uh, not a good thing and it actually uh, reduces the efficiency of the engine. So, one way to avoid that is to offset the intake from the fuselage by a certain distance. So, to calculate that distance, we ran a CFD simulation and found that uh, the ingestion layer was about 10 millimeters uh, of the fuselage. So, just to be on the safe side, we, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, we offset the uh, intake by about 20 millimeters of the fuselage to ensure that we don't ex experience any uh, manual ingestion. Now, uh, running some cost uh, analysis on this entire project, uh, we found that uh, this aircraft might cost us uh, 37 million uh, US dollars per unit with an operating cost of about $5,000 uh, uh, $5, per hour uh, US dollars. I'm going to introduce you to Alex who can take it through our explaining video. So we'll be concluding our uh, presentation with the mission simulation. So uh, let me re-emphasize re the three R's in our mission, which are the reach, retrieve, and return. Uh, to begin with the reach uh, stage, we'll be concluding how uh, the UAV will be performing a vertical thing of the series operating base to the special forces team. So, the nose lifting fan will turn off and the wing lifting fan will be in cruising condition one piece of time uh, after the transition from VTOL to Gorka for the flight. So our aircraft will reach cruise condition as quickly as possible to avoid possible entries. Since our aircraft do not have ailerons, uh, uh, in order to perform rolling maneuvers, will be um, by differentiating the ailer, uh, the thrust of the respective ailerons, we can perform the rolling maneuvers. Uh, the mission we are performing here is about 8,000 feet above mid sea level, which is a uh, typical altitude of a uh, special force operating team. So as we approach a rescue site, the nose lifting fan will be uh, come back to operation. And so uh, the UAV will increase the pitch angle so that the aircraft can slow down and perform beat uh, But depending on the situation, the aircraft may perform loiter um, maneuvers to ensure that this, uh, uh, the uh, terrain is secure to land. So after landing at the rescue site, the wounded soldier will be secured in the litter as we demonstrated earlier in the animation. So the, lift effect, the lifting plan will be turned on again after the um, wounded soldier is secured into the litter. And finally, it is the return stage. So, our UAV would then proceed to exit rapidly enough to ensure the patient's survivability. 
So in this simulation scenario here, we have returned to the base of operation where the medical facilities are located. So thank you for watching the movie. And this concludes the end of our presentation.
therefore have things like Edipat systems or Adipat systems potentially around, even if they're by the account of insurgency aircraft. So this aircraft would need to have a limited radar cross-section. Otherwise, it gives away the position of the people who are trying to be safe. Yeah, um, we considered minimizing the radar. Which leads to a Bravo 2 zero type of situation. Well, we can uh, consider that, but um, we're, we're trying to be a medevac uh, type aircraft, and apparently, uh, according to in the Geneva Convention, that they, they can't be attacked if they're strictly med medical aircraft. I mean, probably Red Cross. Red Cross, yeah. 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 I think you can use the location of an aircraft with a Red Cross on it to attack Yeah, to attack the people. That's true. That's wrong, too. One solution that we were thinking of was to, uh, if that was the case, we could fly and make the Earth very close to the ground so that um, the radars uh, that scan the sky will not be able to detect the Z-4. As, as Michael mentioned, we have sensors to allow it to fly low and fast. Um, it's capable of mapping the terrain, and you also you can use knowledge of previous terrain radar to map out finding any obstacles, systems, and engineering, which you can use to identify or take the best route. The aircraft is autonomous, so it has actually a very low uh, digital footprint in the battlefield because it's autonomous. It does not need to transmit back to base on to maintain where it is, how it's going to get there. It's able to work out its own path. And being able to do that allows it to autonomously and quietly and subtly do its mission without anyone knowing that it's there. And a lot of times when uh, troops are sent in, uh, it's all low key, it's not, it's not broadcast everywhere. Yeah. Especially since it's behind enemy lines, they don't really wish to broadcast this. Yeah. I just did this twice because I can still know it's coming. You've got four of them. It's going to make a lot of noise. But I don't yeah. think it's important, I think, that you know, what we discussed right at the beginning was the Hueys in Korea have a crew survival, a uh, wounded survivor rate of less than 5%. It looks like they're getting the guys out. Well, the guys on the ground think he's come out. He dies on the skin of the hill. So, you know, so I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be that bad, but uh, don't think it's <laughs> that the military pay a great deal of money for that rather than but the reality is they were never allowed to risk a compromise like that, no matter how stealth or map of the aircraft was done. So that's the sad reality of special forces is alone in England. This did come from a British argument. I mean, and their argument was the special forces are not always in close contact. The special forces are often hold up in areas away from so, you know, so, so the British, I mean, the British put the score as a prospect of this. Are there any more questions? It would be nice to include some rudimentary control, so if you're rescuing a pilot and you're cruising the attack, he has the uh, ability to fly within himself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> 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 <laughs>